Um, I'm going to finish chapter 7 today, a very important chapter, and uh, one of the most controversial sections in the book of Romans. Um, But I think we can arrive at some good uh, conclusions despite the controversy and how people view it differently. And then um, the next three sessions, we're going to cover the 39 verses of chapter 8, which is, you know, it's just an an incredible chapter of God's love, the Holy Spirit, uh, eternal life, we're kings, you know, we reign with Christ and all those things. So it's a very, very powerful chapter. But... Tonight is a very key chapter, and, and if we get that chapter right, then it helps us interpret a lot of what we're going to say the next time we meet. So let's start here on page uh, 90, top of page 90. Let's review what we said last time in our fifth session. The Christian is dead to the law through the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. Paul uses the example of a marriage where the wife can marry another husband only if her first husband dies. So again, he was using that, not, he was, wasn't really teaching about marriage, he was showing that as an example for what he wanted to say about our death to the law so that we can be married to Christ. So Christians can only be married to Christ if they die to the law. And this union is what allows us to produce fruit to God. Isn't that powerful? It's not doing more ministry, it's being closer to Jesus, the vine. And it's from that, that fruit, all the fruit ministry can come forth. So rather than trying harder, we get closer to Jesus. And the fruit begins to flow by the Holy Spirit. If we live under law, we will be dominated by flesh and sin. And the law arouses sinful passions. We definitely want to die to the law because we don't want those sinful passions uh, revived. We serve now in the newness of the spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. So the goal of the first eight chapters of Romans, where everything is heading, is chapter 8. Everything's going to chapter 8. That's where we're going to end up. The spirit-empowered, the spirit-filled life. And so Paul begins to address it. In chapter 5, starts talking about chapter 7, really lets it loose in chapter 8. Also, we learned in the last session that the law is not bad. The law is not sin. The law actually gives us the knowledge of sin. We begin to learn and know what sin is all about by the law. The commandment that sin uses to kill us is thou shalt not covet. So even the very desire that's evil is condemned, so that's wrong. Sin uses the law against us. Without the law, sin is dead, but it springs to life when the law is applied. So sin is revived and it brings forth death. So again, we want to emphasize this, sin is the culprit. God's law is good, it's holy, it's just. We are the ones that have the problem. Where flesh is weak, and we're going to definitely see that today. So sin uses the law and the commandment of God to deceive us and kill us. And this again shows us, as we're going to see in verse 13, that sin is utterly sinful. I mean, that sounds kind of redundant, but it really is ugly. It's really evil. It's wrong. It's just terrible. And it only produces death through that which is good, which was the command of God. So tonight, let's begin here, and let's read from Romans 7, verses 13 through 25. Paul uses the word I a lot, ego, the ego. So he's going to talk about himself. This is a very personal account. And let's talk tonight about sin dwells in me. So Romans 7, verse 13. Has then what is good become death to me? Certainly not. No way. But sin, it was sin, that was what was wrong. That it might appear as sin was producing in me through what is good so that sin through the commandment, thou shalt not covet, might become exceedingly sinful. For we know that the law of spiritual But I am carnal, sold under sin. For what I'm doing, I don't understand. 
For what I will to do, that I do not practice. But what I hate, that I do. If, then, I do what I will not to do, I agree with the law that it is good. But now, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. For to will is present with me. That's an interesting wording there. I have the will to do it, but he's going to say in verse 21, evil is present with me too. The will is present with me, but how to perform what is good I do not find. For the good that I will to do, I do not do, but the evil I will not to do, that I practice. Now if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. I find then a law, and this is again a tremendous statement, that evil is present with me. How many of you found that in your life? Evil is present with you. The one who wills to do, and it's the one who wills to do good. Evil's present with me, and yet I want to do good. For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind. That's where the battle is, in the mind. And bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. And then this famous uh, statement that Paul makes, O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? And he says, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. And then he defines uh, how he's been living. He says, so then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God. I'm a slave to the law of God. But with the flesh, I'm a slave to the law of sin. So a a lot of things Paul says here uh, in this chapter, in these last verses here. So let's begin reading here with um, our notes, page 91, Romans 7, 13. So, but let's... Let's first remind ourselves what we were saying last time. In, um, here in verse 13, he uses the phrase, the commandment, at the end of verse 13. So, uh, verse 7 uh, tells you what the commandment is. You, the last part of verse 7 says, you shall not covet. That's the commandment, the 10th commandment. And then in verse 8, he says, the commandment, verse 9, the commandment, verse 10, the commandment, verse 11, the commandment, verse 12, the commandment, verse 13, the commandment. So he tells you what it is in verse 7, and then in, in six successive verses, he tells you this commandment. That is what sin uses. The most is thou shalt not covet. Thou shalt not have evil desires because that is what is going to come out of you when you live out of law. It's going to be a lot of evil desires. So right away he says, is what is good become death to me, the law? He goes, nope, it's not the law, it's sin. And he and it wants to say that it, what was producing death in me, it was the sin, but he was it was using what was good, which was the law of God, the commandment of God. And so... It not only reveals sin in us, but it just goes to show you how bad uh, we can really be. So let's read here from our notes. It was not the law, but sin that brought Paul death. The law makes sin more visible and allows us to see how sinful we really are. Paul really lays it out here in this seventh chapter here. Paul thought that the commandment would bring him life. Remember that there in verse... um, 10, he says, the commandment, which I thought, hey, this commandment is going to bring me life. He found, found out, oh no, actually, it brought me death. Sin used that to bring me death. And this was the deception. He says that in verse 11. He said, it deceived me. You know, sin deceived me. I thought this was going to bring me life, keeping this commandment. He says, nope, and it ended up bringing me death. So we can just see how exceedingly sinful then sin is through the commandment. In other words, sin is enhanced. We see it a lot more, better under the law, under the microscope of the law, we see sin a lot clearer. Edward says, the law, by arousing the slumbering demon 
of sin to life makes sin's true character even more apparent. The law cannot be blamed for death any more than a detective who discovers a corpse can be said to be the killer. So the sin is the real culprit, not the law. <clears throat> Top of page 92, <clears throat> Nee says, we need to have our weakness proved to ourselves beyond dispute, and that is why God gave us the law. As you guys know, uh, there's a lot of people proclaiming their own goodness. They're, they're always telling you how, how good they are. I'm not a bad person. I have, I'm not a murderer. I'm not a rapist. I haven't been to prison. And they, they proclaim their own goodness, and yet Paul emphatically makes that point in Romans 3 where he says there's none righteous. No, not one. There's no one that's right at all. All have fallen short of the glory of God. All are being condemned. All are going, um, need to be silenced, really. The law says shut your mouth. That's what it says in Romans 3, 19. Shut your mouth. The whole world is guilty before God. No one is right. Nobody is perfect. Everybody fails and everybody misses it. And that's why we desperately need a Savior. <clears throat> F.F. F. Bruce says, the law showed me what was wrong, right, and what was wrong. Without the supplying the power to do the former, to be, do right, and to avoid the latter, doing wrong. Mm -hmm. So that we're going to hit next time in chapter 8. And uh, I think I'm going to say it here shortly, but... Remember how we emphasized early on in these chapters, knowing we need to know the, dead, the old man is dead. We need to know that. We knew that we raised up to life. But so what? So what if you know that? You got to go live it out. Mm -hmm. And the only way you and I can live out the power of the gospel is we need the power of God. Yes. You need the Holy Spirit. So I'm going to emphasize this. I don't know when it's coming up. I know I wrote it down somewhere, but... Um, that's why if you just hear the word on Sunday morning or on Tuesday or Wednesday or wherever you are in a Bible study, if you just hear the word, you might as well go buy a box of crackers because without the Holy Spirit, you can't live that out. It's impossible. You can't live out the perfect law of God. You can't walk, be holy as God is holy without the Holy Spirit. It's impossible. So we need chapter 8 desperately to give us the power to live what we know is true. Stott says, we are right to look to the law for moral guidance, but wrong to look for it for saving power. The law can't save us. The law can't empower us. The law can only tell us you're right, you're wrong, and when you miss it, it condemns you. Paul is saying that one cannot see how evil sin is unless he realizes and as he realizes that sin takes what is good, that is the divine command, and uses it to bring death to men. That's terrible, isn't it? The sin takes the very holy law of God. He use, it uses that, and it kills you. Oh, that's terrible. That just shows you how bad sin is. <clears throat> and I know there's some people in our church that they think they're pretty good. And... Um, and there was a time when, there was a time, especially I think when you're young, you're, you got a big head, you got a lot of pride, and you haven't had a chance to live life and go through trials to humble you. God always humbles us uh, over the years. The older you get, the more you, you be, if you're following the Lord, the more humble you will get. As, as Moose says, uh, we never become sinless, but we end up sinning less. <laughs> Um, but I have learned, and I think you have too, right, that uh, we're not trusting in our own goodness, but in Christ's righteousness. It's not how good we are, how good we can be. It's Christ's righteousness. That's what counts at the end of the day. Am I ahead of myself? Am I okay? All right. So... The problem is not law, the problem is sin. So now Paul's going to compare himself with the law. So sin's bad, we know that. Law's good. What about me and you? How are we doing? And that's where he's going to compare himself. Paul's going to put the law up to himself 
And he goes, you know what? The law is spiritual, but I'm not. <laughs> I am a carnal. I am sold under sin. So we want to say, as we begin this uh, portion of Scripture, that there are really three basic positions that people take about what Paul says here. One of the positions is that Paul was a believer, definitely a believer in Jesus Christ. And there are verses here that you have to conclude he's a believer, and we'll cover those when we're there. There's other verses like this one here that makes it look like, no, he was not a believer. It looks like he's when he, he was an unbeliever because he, he just finished telling us that we were dead to sin. Now he's saying he's sold under sin. So how do you reconcile those two in your head? He had to be an unbeliever. And then there's other people, there's, there's a new teaching now, and I, I don't think it's not new as in it's wrong, it's just a new teaching. They're saying, no, he was a pious Jew, a Pharisee, living under law, and he realized, hey, I need to, I need to get saved. No, not really. Uh, we know because of what he said in other places, but there's some people that believe he was writing as a Jew living under law, and that's why sin dominated him. So each of these positions, basically three, there are strong points that we can find in the text, and it also has some weak points. So uh, I hope to point those out as we're going through. Um, and one of the things we can ask ourselves right away, why would Paul say what he says if he just finished teaching that we're dead to sin and dead to the law? I mean, he just finished... I mean, we were all excited, woo-hoo, that, you know, we're dead to sin. The death of Jesus has put sin to death in us, and the, the law is dead. And, and now he's over here talking about how sin is completely defeating him. It's like, this, this doesn't reconcile. When you, why did you teach us all of this stuff, and why did you tell us that Jesus came, and we have the grace of God, and now you tell us we're all defeated? It just doesn't seem to make sense. It doesn't reconcile with what he just finished saying. So we have to ask ourselves too, does this mean that we just keep on sinning and live a defeated life? Uh, is that what Paul is saying here? And in fact, there's a lot of people, and some of the commentators pointed it out, people will say, oh, you know what? I'm just struggling with sin, just like Paul. You know, Paul did the same thing. He was sinning big time too. And uh, he, he, he was defeated. He had to cry out to God. And uh, so I'm just like Paul. And everything, why is this so common to Christians? And uh, this past two days, I ran through in my mind all the sins that we've had in this church over the last, let's just say the last 25 years. Oh, oh my goodness. You know how much, you know, I mean, and looking at my own life, I don't have to look at anybody else's life, I just have to look at my own life. But all the stuff that has happened in this little church, I, I had to go take a Tylenol when <laughs> <laughs> I just started thinking about it, and if it, was, if it wasn't so humorous, we would cry, because we've had adultery, we have, we've had pregnant teens, two years ago, two of our men were arrested for DUIs, nobody knew, uh, pornography, divorce, a guy was beating his wife regularly. And I started going through all the different things, the division, the gossip, people causing strife, people lying, people openly lying to me and Pastor Rick about stuff. Just over and over and over and over again, the lies, the deception, the darkness, the evil. And you know, that was only the stuff we heard about. Can you imagine if you throw in all the secret sins that people are doing? We have, we really, God's merciful to us. I mean, uh, again, I don't know how we even survived. Can you imagine what it's like in bigger churches where there's no accountability and people are just coming and doing whatever they want? And, and just, again, a lot of terrible things that have happened here in this little church where people have been practicing a lot of evil things. But... We have to ask ourselves, if this is Paul living under the law before his conversion, 
Why doesn't he just say so? His claim elsewhere in scripture is that he was blameless regarding the law. He never talked like this when he was a Pharisee. He wouldn't say stuff like this. In fact, in Philippians, he says, I was blameless regarding the righteousness of the law. I was blameless. He didn't see himself hating what he was doing. He never talked that way. So anyway, a lot of these things don't make sense and, and based on some of the conclusions people are drawing. But, but what is the fundamental issue here? I'm truly dead to sin and to the law. But here's the problem. But sin still dwells in me. So sin still exists and it has influence in my life. But my charge, as Jose said, quoting uh, Romans 6, that should be 6.12, don't let sin reign in your mortal body to obey its lust. So there will always be a battle, a struggle, a fight against sin until the day I die. I hate to tell you that. We're dead to sin. We're dead to law. We have the Holy Spirit, but you're going to have to fight. We know that because sin dwells in us. That's what he says. Just because we know something, there we go, doesn't mean we're living it. Just because we know Jesus died for our sins and I'm dead, the old man is dead, that doesn't mean we're living it out day by day. We could still be totally defeated to a secret sin and nobody even knows about it but us. Not even our wife or husband knows what we're doing and we're totally defeated by it. And yet we come in singing, the old man is dead, the old man is dead. <laughs> yeah, but you're not dead. <laughs> you're still, your sin is very much alive in your life. We have the indwelling Holy Spirit. We have the abundance of grace. We have the gift of righteousness. And all of our victories are won through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We know that. Amen, yes. But this is the great challenge of the Christian life. The spirit and sin dwell in you. That's the trouble. So the question we have to ask is, who rules? Spirit, the flesh, or the spirit? The spirit lusts against the flesh, and the flesh against the spirit, and they're contrary to one another. <laughs> so we have two masters, in a way, fighting for our rulers, for our allegiance, really. So <clears throat> Paul is saying here again in verse 14 that the problem it's not the law, it's me, the flesh. And, it, and this is especially going to be true as we get over to chapter 8. That's where the flesh really comes out. He's been talking sin, 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 sin. But then in chapter 8, he's all of a sudden, he's going to let you know what he said in verse uh, 18. Uh, there's nothing good dwells in me. He's talking about the flesh. In the next chapter, wow, he just talks about the flesh, 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 the spirit in the flesh, the spirit in the flesh, spiritually minded, carly minded, so on. So he is saying, the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual. The laws of God, but I am literally carnal, is composed of flesh. And this affirms what he's going to say in verse 18, that in my flesh, nothing good dwells. There's not a single thing good in me in my flesh. I know this is not a good thing, but Christians can be carnal, right? Right? Go to, go to the next book, 1 Corinthians, just for one minute. They say carnal Christians is an oxymoron, which means they don't belong together. But, I hate to tell you this, there's, a lot, there's been a lot of carnal Christians at Clovis Christian Center. <laughs> the C's, carnal Christian, Clovis Christian Center. What does he say here in 1 Corinthians 3? Verse 1 through 4. And I, brethren, could not even speak to you as to spiritual people, because, but as to carnal, as to babes in Christ. I fed you with milk and not with solid food. For until now you were not able to receive it. And even now you're still not able. Why? For you are still carnal. For where there are envy and strife and divisions among you, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? 
For when one says, I am of Paul, and another says, I'm of Apollos, are you not carnal? He's saying, you guys are carnal. You guys have envy and strife and divisions and arguing among one another. He goes, I can't even give you the word of God, uh, the solid meat of God's word because you're so carnal. You can't receive it. And if you read a lot of the stuff going on right now in some of the big mega churches, you can hear all the division. They're firing pastors. They're uh, just scandalous stuff that's coming out on the national news of what pastors have done with women and money and pride. And, and that one pastor, McDonald, at that Harvest Bible Church there in Chicago, it's, it's public news, so I could say it, but he, he was interviewed by a secular radio station cussing and using foul language, putting down other people. It's like, wait a minute, this is, he's a pastor of a church. What is he doing? And so we're carnal. I hate to say that. We, people are carnal. That's not the way God wants it. God doesn't want us to live that way. But the fact of the matter is, it is, it is it, that's the way it is. I used to get so frustrated when I first came to this church. I was so frustrated. I was so mad at so many people. I was frustrated about everything and everybody. And I go, can't anyone do it right? Can't we just halfway? Can't we even do it halfway right? I was so upset with everybody. And then I started reading the New Testament. <laughs> The Corinthians were getting drunk on the communion wine. A guy was living with his father's wife. The Galatians were into legalism. The Colossians were into false philosophy. First John was dealing with all these false teachers. And I thought, forget it. Get over it. You know, Christians are going to do sinful things. You just have to keep going. You just have to keep serving God. If they keep go south, you keep going for the Lord. So we don't like it. I wish it wasn't that way. I wish there weren't carnal Christians. I wish everybody was just towing the line. I wish everybody was doing things the right way. And, but it's not the way it is. You just have to keep walking in love. You just have to keep praying for people. You just have to keep forgiving people. You just have to keep going and keep going and keep going. Despite what other people are going to do, just keep going for the Lord. So give it up on the frustration, you know. <laughs> Yeah, we just have to give it up and keep moving forward. I love, I love, I love Paul. I think he's just an amazing guy. Do we even have to talk about what Moses had to suffer? Can you imagine with a congregation of like three million people, all of them complaining, ready to stone you? Just every turn, they're, they got idols, their snakes are coming at them. I mean, everything is going wrong. And yet, that was the people of God. That was God's people that he was leading to the promised land. Paul, the Corinthians, he goes, you are proof of my apostleship in the Lord. Why? He goes, you, you guys are proof that I'm an apostle of grace. Because if I wasn't, you guys would be dead. <laughs> God would kill all of you. <laughs> it's proof that God has a lot of grace. How many of you can say amen to our church? We, we have received a lot of grace. We don't deserve where we're at. None of us, our church, we're blessed as a church. We have a lot of good things happening in our church in every area. We have a lot of good things happening. But I'm telling you, we don't deserve it at all. No. We, we, de we deserved a lot worse uh, things happening to us. So, man, God is really, God is patient. Man, I don't know how he puts up with us. He is long-suffering, it's true. Here, Paul says, I'm sold under sin. Sold reminds us of the slavery part of sin. It's a Greek perfect participle. In other words, you were that way in the past, and you're really still that way right now. The only reason you've been brought out from under that is because of Christ. But this is the state of a, of a sinner. Without the Lord, we're sold under sin. We're out, without Him, we are nothing. Galatians 3.22 says, but the scripture declares that the whole world is a prisoner of sin. Romans 3.9 says we are under the power of sin. And he's going to say here in just a few uh, verses, in verse 23, that sin has brought me into captivity. It's made me a prisoner. I'm a prisoner to sin. Wow, sin seeks to enslave us. Top of page 94 Stott, I love this, how he says it. Can we really maintain 
that all Christians are simultaneously set free from sin and then were sold as slaves to sin? <laughs> How can, how, can you, how can you reconcile these two things happening at once? Chapter 6 says we're set free, and here Paul says, well, I'm sold under sin. You know? So again, that's a problem that some people have in reconciling what Paul is trying to say. Schreiner says this, the most significant objection to seeing verses 14 through 25 as depicting Christian experience is the depth of defeat to and bondage under sin related here. And that's true. As, he, as he's writing all this, it sounds like he's just defeated completely by sin. And uh, that he, he's at war and he's having to cry out to God just to deliver him. <clears throat> uh, Edward says, what Paul says of the law, he cannot say of himself, right? He says the law is spiritual, it's good, but not me. I'm carnal, I'm sold under sin. Paul is showing us what a Christian believer looks like when he tries to live his life under the law. He will be dominated by sin. Compare with Romans 6.14, right? That sin will have no dominion over us for we're not under the law but under grace. So if we live under law, we're going to be dominated by sin. So this is what it's like to be married to law and not married to Christ. We be, are totally defeated to sin. <clears throat> One of the, here as we go to verse 15, this is perhaps the biggest frustration you will have as a believer. And I want you to notice from here on out, Paul is going to use present tense verbs. And this is why some people say that Paul was speaking as a Christian as he was writing this right now. All these verbs are present tense. He's talking about what he's doing right now. And if you backed up to verses 7 through 12, all the verses are past tense. He would say, I died. I uh, died. I was deceived, I was killed, I was revived. They're all ED, they're all past tense. But here, he's talking a very personal. Right now, this is what's happening to me right now at this very moment. But right now, this is, a, this is an enigma, is it not? We don't know what we're, we don't understand. We don't understand why we do this. We want to do what's right, but we don't practice it. And the, the exact opposite, the very thing that we hate, the thing that we know is wrong, that's what we do. And I tell you, that will frustrate you. And you, you, you will sit and call a timeout and sit on the couch and go, what am I doing? Why did I just do that? So Paul is saying, I, I can't figure myself out. I'm a mystery to myself. Why is it that I do the very thing that I hate? And what, what he's doing is he's getting ready to lay the bomb out at the end of verse 17 and at the end of verse 20. Those phrases are the same. Sin that dwells in me. Verse 20, sin that dwells in me. That's really what he really got the revelation on was sin was inside of him. Uh, Seneca says, this was a Roman statesman. He was, not a, he was not a Christian. He was a Roman statesman and philosopher. He said, Men hate their sins and love them at the same time. It's <laughs> so true. We hate it, and yet there's something inside that really likes what we did. Mm. Carner says, what I hate, I do. This does not sound like the experience of a sinner, but of a religious man, or the experience of most believers in Christ, if not all. And that's one of the main reasons people say Paul was writing as a Christian, because as a sinner and a worldly person, we were not hating bad things. We actually liked them. <laughs> I don't know about you, but when I was in the world, I didn't say, oh man, I really hated that. No, I really actually liked what I was doing, and it was evil. And that, because I was blind, I didn't know. I was in darkness. <laughs> John Wesley... <laughs> Ah, uh, John Wesley, the Methodist founder, he says, Before I had <laughs> willingly served sin, but now it was unwillingly, but still I serve sin. <laughs> Before I did it, I just did it because I wanted to do it. Now I don't want to do it, but I still do it. <laughs> oh, oh, man. <clears throat> Galatians 5.17, right? Paul was talking to Christians. He says, the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. These are contrary to one another 
so that you do not do the things that you wish or the things that you want to do. Schreiner again says, such a desire is not characteristic of unbelievers. It is only the regenerate, those who have been regenerated by the Holy Spirit, who hate what is evil and delight in the good, yet they find themselves practicing evil. Origen, the early church father, said, Paul does not say that the weak man does not know what he is doing, but rather that he doesn't understand why he is doing it. We know we're doing wrong. He says, I'm doing what I hate, but he, I don't understand it. How come I do that? Why is it that I don't do what I want to do? Why is it that the very thing I hate, I end up doing? So it's not just a matter of what, it was a matter of why. Why am I doing this? Well, he's going to find out the, the revelation he has here is this because it was sin that was dwelling in me. Because if it wasn't me that wanted to do it, it had to be something else. And so he says it was sin. Verse 16 here where he talks about if I do this, if I, if I will to do something and I don't do it, then I'm agreeing. <laughs> the law is right. It was right all along. It was showing me how sinful I really am. <clears throat> Edward says the tragic irony of our contrary behavior does not negate the law, but it actually confirms it. The law is right. We are sinful people. Uh, and Romans tells us that and Galatians tells us that that the whole world needs to be quiet, shut up before the law and admit we are guilty before God. So God's law, again, for one final word of emphasis here, verse 12, the law is holy, the commandment is holy, just, and good. Verse 14, the law is spiritual. And here in verse 16, the law is good. So God's law is perfect because it was given by a perfect God. And so the law reveals the character of God. There's nothing wrong with the law, but there's something definitely wrong with us. <clears throat> uh, Wearsby says, this, of course, is a different problem than that in Romans 6. The problem there was, how can I stop doing bad things? While here the problem is, how can I ever do anything good? So back then... We are dead to sin. That's how we stop. But over here, Paul's trying to figure out how come I can't do what is good? That's not, that's our problem. We don't have the power to do what is good. And that's why New Year's resolutions never work. Diets never work. Uh, I'm going to stop being angry. When you say that, you're going to be angry tomorrow. <clears throat> Even trying to do good things. I'm going to witness more. I'm going to pray more. I'm going to love my husband more. I'm going to be a better Christian. I'm going to give more to the Lord. You, you, can't, you can't do any of that without the power of the Holy Spirit. I think I shared this last time I was teaching this. I remember a year or so ago, Irma was in Mexico, and Daniel and I were here, and I drove Daniel to school, and I dropped him off. And I was so excited. I go, good. I got the house to myself. I'm all alone. I'm going to pray. It's just going to be me and Jesus. I'm going to read the word. I'm going to pray like I've never... I'm going to pray loud because Irma, <laughs> Irma gets bothered when I'm praying loud. It, it disrupts what she's doing. So I said, I got the whole house to myself. Man, it's me and Jesus. I got home. I started reading the Bible. I fell asleep. <laughs> And then I tried to get up, and, I, and, I, and, I, and my head kept bobbing. <laughs> it was shot. I think I just went and made a sandwich. <laughs> I thought, man, how come I can't do it? What's wrong with me? So it's funny how we, we do those things, and we realize how powerless we are without the Lord. We need the Lord. <clears throat> So the bottom line is that the law is good and I'm not. And again, no believer would make this statement. <clears throat> no, I never said when I sinned, when I was in the world, I never said, you know what? God, your law is right. I'm a sinner. I never said that. I didn't even know there was a law. <laughs> I, I did whatever I wanted to do, you know? So that was crazy. <clears throat> So here in verse 17, we're going to pick up a very, very key word that Paul has not used to this point, but he's going to use it a lot now, and that's this word dwells. Um, and 
the word dwell means somebody has moved in, like they, they've taken residence in a home. So you'll see it in verse 17, dwells. You'll see it in verse 18, dwells. No, nothing good dwells. Verse 20 says, uh, sin dwells in me. And then when we get into the next chapter, in chapter um, 9, he's going to say, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Verse 11, but if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal body through His Spirit who dwells in you. So now he's going to talk about who is in you, who's living in you. And um, so he says it a lot. So isn't that an amazing thing? Sin dwells in me, verse 17, verse 20, and chapter 8 says the Holy Spirit dwells in you. So the sin dwells in you, the Spirit dwells in you. That's where the war is right there. So they talk about indwelling sin. Well, this is where they got it. The NCV says, but I am not really the one who is doing these hated things. It is sin living in me that does them. <clears throat> so I kind of like this verse. It wasn't me. It was yeah. sin. <laughs> I don't have responsibility. The devil made me do this, you know. <laughs> like Flip Wilson used to say, well, the devil made me do it. Well, as Cranfield says, this verse is not intended as an excuse, but it, rather it's an acknowledgement of the extent to which sin dwelling in the Christian usurps authority over his life. So we see, we really do begin to see, hey man, if I'm willing to do what is good and yet I don't do it and I do the very thing I hate and God hates, then it can't be me doing it. It's got to be sin that's dwelling in me. Schreiner says, Paul affirms that I am uh, not performing the evil. The responsibility for evil rests on indwelling sin. Paul does not deny responsibility, but he confesses impotence. So he's saying, I don't have the power to overcome this. That's why he's going to cry out needing the Lord. We really need the Lord. <clears throat> How many of you found that the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak? And you know, when, when the, the person um, who said that was Jesus, and do you remember when he said it? <laughs> and it's classic. I think it illustrates for us where, where, where we are. Um, it was when he told his apostles, um, can you stay here and pray? Because I'm going to go over there and pray. Can you pray? And he goes and prays, and he comes back. They're just fast asleep, you know. And he goes, man, couldn't you just pray with me for one hour? And he, that's when just the Lord said, the spirit is willing, the flesh is weak. And one of the areas I think of the greatest weakness that we have to overcome is our prayer lives. Yeah. A lot of people have very weak prayer lives. And they can't figure out why they, they don't want to pray. Well, that's the source of power. That's the place where of life is prayer. So the enemy is going to work overtime on you and your flesh is going to work overtime on you and everything is going to work overtime on you to keep you out of the prayer closet because that's your source of power. And the minute you get out of the prayer closet and get away from the prayer closet, you're going to go downhill. You will. Stott says the conflict is between desire and performance. The will is there, but the ability to do it is not there. And, and that's what Paul's going to say in the next chapter when he starts talking about the Holy Spirit there. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh. The law was perfect, but we weak fleshly men could not do what the law was saying. Stott says the law has been fatally weakened by the sarks. That's the Greek word, flesh. The flesh is what's the problem. And again, Cranfield says this is a confession of the self's powerlessness for good. We can't do it. We, we don't have the ability to do it. We are fallen creatures. The desperateness of Paul's situation is demonstrated by the fact that even though he desires to do good, he's not able to do it. So, have you ever tried a diet or fast? You're going to fast? It was always amazing to me when I used to work downtown 
that the very days I was fasting, that was when the secretaries brought all the donuts. That's when they brought the donuts into the, to the thing. Why did you guys not bring donuts yesterday? That's not my fast day. You guys always bring donuts on this day. Well, we find out just how strong we really are when we try to do something spiritual. <laughs> the NCV of verse 19 says, I do not do the good things I want to do, but I do the bad things that I don't want to do. And Connor just says it flat out. I like it. Man does that which is evil because he is evil. Note the word evil here and also this tremendous statement in verse 21. Evil is present with me. It really is. And, and I think you feel it a lot. Like when you're angry or you're, you're tempted to lust or you're, you're um, jealous of somebody or you're, you're enraged about something. Man, you can feel, you can feel uh, the ugliness. And after you're done with what you're, you're going to do, you just feel like, wow, man, that was bad. Yeah, you are bad. <laughs> That's a sad reality. <clears throat> so in verse 15, he was talking kind of in general terms. I will to do, I don't do that, but what I hate. But now he's going to get a little bit more specific and he's saying the good that I will to do, I don't do. But it's the very evil thing that I don't, that I, I, I will not to do. That's what I'm practicing. So he brings this word up, evil. And Ambrose says, again, are showing our powerlessness and showing that just because we know something doesn't, doesn't mean that we're doing it. He goes, do you think that anyone with a knowledge of sin can avoid it? Just because we know that something's bad, do you think you can avoid it just because you know that? No, you're going to need the power of the Holy Spirit to avoid it. <clears throat> Verse 20. The NCV says, So if I do things I don't want to do, then I am not the one doing them. It is sin living in me that does these things. So this is a basically a repeat of what he just finished saying in verse 17. He says it again in verse 20 here. The evil power that has established a base of operations in him, verses 8 and 11, we talked about that last week, has caused him to do evil. Remember that word that Paul used in verse 8 and 11 where he says that um, sin took an opportunity, took advantage of the commandment. And that word was to, to establish a base of operations. It was a military term. So that's what sin does. It moves in with the commandment and establishes its base of operations to attack us. <clears throat> so now he's arriving at some understanding. Before he had no idea, he was just stating that. He goes, I don't understand what I'm doing. But now he says, okay, now I'm finding out what's happening here. That evil is present with me. So this is a tremendous truth that many are not aware of. That evil is present with me. And it is the present, it is the present, it's present in the one who wills to do good. Isn't that interesting? That he, he says, evil's present with me. And he doesn't say, oh yeah, I'm a really bad person. He says, no, it's present with me and I'm a person who, wants, who wills to do good. I want to do good. But evil is right there stopping me. And <clears throat> I, I want to point this out, not to impress you with a Greek word here, but I want to point this out because I think it, Paul is saying something very strong here. When... When the Greek language wants to say something loud, like when you're reading this and you want to say it louder, the way it does it, like with this pronoun here, if he just wanted to say me or my, he would say moi. But if he wants you to say it really loud as you're reading it, he puts a little e, the epsilon in front of it. So it's a moi. So I want to read this now with that in mind, how he uses it. So in verse 17... Hear how Paul says this, but the last part of 17, but sin that dwells in me, for I know that in me, verse 18, for to will is present with me. And then he's going to say it again in verse 20, but sin that dwells in me, verse 21, that evil is present, it's with me, 
That's what he's saying. He's saying it loud. He's saying, it's in me. <laughs> Isn't it shocking? Sin, evil is inside of me. <laughs> so he's really emphasizing that. <clears throat> he wants you to hear that very clearly. The NLT said, I have discovered this principle of life that when I want to do what is right, I inevitably do what is wrong. <clears throat> the USB says the term for law is best understood in this context as a principle. And the use of law has nothing to do with the law of God. So when he says there, I found a law, he's not talking about the law of Moses. He's talking about, I found this principle. I found this thing of life that I didn't know before. I've learned a principle here. You might say, I learned a rule of life that I didn't know. Now I see that evil is present with me. Verse 22 and again, no unbeliever would ever say this. Only a believer would say this. Um, the NLT says, I love God's law with all my heart. An unbeliever would never say that. So Paul, in this context, Paul had to be talking as a believer. <clears throat> Bruce says, it is difficult to view the speaker here as other than a believer. And Cranfield says, the inner man of which Paul speaks is the working of God's spirit within the Christian man. And you see that there at the end of uh, verse 22. He says, I delight in the law of God according to the inward man. And that phrase, the inner man, the inward man, is only used two other places, 2 Corinthians 4.16 and Ephesians 3.16, where Paul is clearly talking about Christians. Ephesians 3.16 talks about the Holy Spirit strengthening the inner man. So there's so again, this is another verse showing that Paul was speaking as a Christian believer. <clears throat> and when Paul uses the word, the mind here, he's talking about the inward man. Uh, when he gets to it in the next verses, he's going to talk about the law of my mind. It's the inner man, the, the, the thoughts, your, your whole emotions, your soul, your, the inner part of you. And he's going to say the law of God now, verse 22, verse 23, let me see, where is it at? No, verse 22, verse 25, and he's also going to talk about it again in verse chapter 8, verse 7, the law of God. That's going back to the law of Moses. <clears throat> so here in verse 23, we see that when we want to do the law of God, when we want to do what's right, there's a war, <laughs> And we find this other law that's at work. We have the law of the mind. My mind wants to do one thing, but there's another law called the, what Paul calls the law of sin. And he says, it's at work in my members. Remember that phrase? The members. We're supposed to present our members. And Paul had just used that in verse 5, where he says, for when we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit to death. And now he's going to use it twice here. I see another law in my members. And then he says that at the end of verse, the verse, the law of sin, which is in my members. So I see in my very heart, my mind, my hands, my feet, the way I think, the way I hear, all that, that all of this is at work inside of me. <clears throat> this law of sin that's bringing me down, bringing me into captivity. So I want to stress this here at the top of page 99. Just because we can conceive something in my mind does not mean that you can carry it out with your body. Just just because you say, I'm going to do this, doesn't necessarily mean you can carry it out or that you have the strength to carry it out. The ERB says, but I see another law working in my body. That law makes war against the law that my mind accepts. That other law working in my body is the law of sin, and that law makes me its prisoner. So Connor is right. <laughs> That's where the battlefield, right, is in the mind. That's where the war, the battle is over the mind and your whole thought life and how you're thinking about things is definitely where the war is. So the problem, again, is not the law of God. The problem is the law of sin and man. And this law of sin is, is the very evil principle, the very tyranny of, of uh, indwelling sin that's in each one of us. <clears throat> So he's going to mention this law of sin here in verse 23. He's going to say it again in verse 
uh, 25. And that's when, when he gets over to, to the next chapter, when he talks about the Holy Spirit, that it's the law of the Spirit, chapter 8, verse 2, the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the law of sin and death. So we need the Holy Spirit now to empower us to be able to do all of this. Cranfield says, it would seem that Paul is here using the word law metaphorically. It denotes exercise, power, authority, control, and that he means by the law of sin, that power, the authority, and control exercised over us by sin. So when he's using the law of sin, he's saying there is something, there is a law, there's a power, there's authority that's working against us. <clears throat> so Moose says God's law simply does not have the power to deliver us from the power of sin. That's not what it was ever meant for, but Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit certainly was. So, Closing out here, verse 24, Oh, what a miserable man I am. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? And here, this translation has it correctly from the Greek, Who is going to deliver me from this body of death? <clears throat> we, feel this, we feel this body of death as we get older, when we're sick, when we sin against God, we feel we are in a body of death. Who's going to deliver me out of this body? <clears throat> it's interesting that the only other place in the New Testament where this Greek word for wretched appears is in Revelation 3.17 to the Laodicean church when Jesus said to them, don't you realize that you are wretched? So he was, Jesus was talking to a church <laughs> when he told them, you guys are wretched. Remember, they were the lukewarm church. Mm -hmm. And that's the only other place where that word appears. Edward says, when one discovers not only a power at work within oneself against one's best interest, but also there's a powerlessness to combat it, then one must look for help beyond oneself. I like that. Once you realize, once you and I realize that we're powerless against sin, then and we can't overcome it by our own self-will or own determination or we're going to try harder and we realize that, that's awesome. We can realize, say, hey, I need Jesus. I need something more powerful than I. As long as we're trying to deliver our, yourself, the Christian life will be one frustration and defeat after another. We will always be defeated if we try to deliver ourselves. I love what Watchman Nee says. There is nothing more musical in the ears of the Lord. This cry is the most spiritual and the most scriptural cry a man can utter. He only utters it when he knows he can do nothing and he gives up making any further resolutions. <laughs> when you finally say, you know what? I can't stop being angry or covetous or lustful or anything else. I can't do it without the Lord. And being delivered by the Lord. Jesus came to deliver us and take away our sin. We can't do it ourselves. He has to take it away. God has been waiting for this cry from man after every self-effort has failed. So that, is the, that would be a beautiful thing once a person surrenders, right? Isn't that what we're trying to get with a lot of our family and friends? If they would just give up and surrender and give it to God then God can work with them. But until then, they're just going to keep, keep right on sinning. Paul is a drowning man crying out for rescue. The word for wretched, to lie poros, means that the situation is critical and beyond his power to change it. If salvation is to come, it must come from a whom, who, not a what. It must come from the outside and apart from his own resources or it will not come. So there's only one way, you guys know the way, to be delivered, and you just have to surrender completely to Jesus Christ. But I think, isn't it a process that God takes us through? Because we, again, we think we're good, and we think we have the power to do this. And all the people trying diets, and all the different things that we try to do, exercising, and all those things, and we quit, and we throw in the towel, and we stop reading, and we're going to read more of the Bible, and we stop reading the Bible, and all those things. We finally have to just surrender and say, I've got to trust in God's grace and not my righteousness. NLT says, verse 25, Thank God the answer is in Christ Jesus our Lord. 
So you see how it is in my mind. I really want to obey God's law, but because of my sinful nature, I'm a slave to sin. Moo says, here is one of the most important arguments in favor of applying verses 14 through 25 to Christian experience. For only a Christian knows to thank God for deliverance in Christ. Significantly, the person who gives thanks for deliverance immediately goes on to reiterate his divided state. Surely this shows that Paul writes as a Christian. And Moo doesn't believe that Paul wrote as a Christian here. He just says this is one of the convincing verses that does say that he's a Christian. So Mu believes he was a Jew living under law. <clears throat> the chapter closes with a reminder that the Christian life is one of tension and struggle. Isn't that interesting? Verse 25 says, Thank God Jesus has saved me. So then, <laughs> with my mind I serve the law of God, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. You would think after that he goes, I have total victory. I have complete delivered. Nope. The battle is still on, is what Paul is saying at the end of the verse. I wish he would have just stopped at the Lord, thank God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, and then he would have been done. But no, he says, actually, no, I serve God, but I'm also in the flesh too, and I don't want to do that, but I don't please God when I do that, but that happens. The last slide, I think. Edward just says it very simply. Our one anchor is the promise and presence of the resurrected Lord who gives grace for the present struggle and eternal life in the world to come. So it's in him that I find true deliverance. There's no other way to overcome our flesh and our sins except through Jesus Christ. Amen. And yet, you're going to struggle. There's going to be a tension. There's going to be a fight. And it's every day, I hate to say it, but it's every day we're battling sin that dwells in us. All right, so the next time we meet, we're going to get the power source. We know we're dead to sin. We know we're dead to law. We know we have sin dwelling in us, but now we're going to get real power.